Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Andrew Rathbun. Based in the greater Lansing area in Michigan, Andrew is a digital forensics and incident response expert with experience in both the private sector and in law enforcement. Andrew is also the administrator of the very popular digital forensics Discord server, as well as a contributor contributor to About DFIR and to multiple GitHub repositories, all of which we'll link to in the transcript of this episode on the Lean Pub website. You can follow him on Twitter at Buns of Wrath 12 and check out his work at aboutdfir.com. Andrew is a co author on the Lean Pub books, Easy Tools Manuals, and The Hitchhiker's Guide to DFIR Experiences from Beginners and Experts. In The Hitchhiker's Guide to DFIR, Andrew and his co authors published a unique crowdsourced DFIR book by members of the Digital Forensics Discord server and in Easy Tools Manuals. He offers readers the official manual for all of his colleague Eric Zimmerman's free and popular open source command line and GUI tools. In this interview, we're going to talk about Andrew's background and career, professional interests, his books, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience as a self-published author and community creator. So thank you very much, Andrew, for being on the Front Matter podcast. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, I know you have an interesting one. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your background and how you've found your way into a career in uh, DFIR. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll kind of start from the beginning, I guess. Um, so when I'll start at high school, because I don't think before high school really matters. But so once, you know, when I was in high school, I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps um, as an infantryman. So this was in 2004. Um, I graduated 2005 from high school. So I went to boot camp immediately after that. Um, so from like June to December, I was in basically boot camp and in, uh, my infantry training. And then after that, I did a semester at college and then I went to Iraq. So I, I was gone for about a year. I uh, did about five months pre-deployment training and then seven months in combat. So my entire 19th year on this earth was pretty much in combat in Fallujah or training to be in Fallujah. A little bit different than probably what other 19 year olds were doing at the time. So um, kind of a unique, it gave me some, you know, unique life perspective at such a young age. So as a result, what's the logical thing to do when you're in the infantry, you know, in the Marine Corps? Well, it's become a cop, <laughs> you know, you know how to use weapons and, you know, you have all the skills that you need to be, you know, a, a successful police officer. So I did go to college, you know, get my uh, bachelor's in criminal justice and sociology. And then I went to the police academy. And then I got hired at the Michigan State University Police Department, where I was for about seven years. Um, I was a patrol officer for four years, and then I was a detective for three years. Uh, when I was a detective, I started doing digital forensics. So I was doing like the general crime. So like, you know, hey, someone stole my laptop, um, someone vandalized my car, you know, someone hit my car and then, you know, drove away, that sort of thing. Those are the kind of cases that I was working but also uh, we were doing uh, digital front or I was doing digital forensic investigations as well as, you know, my, my coworkers um, that we shared a lab, that I shared a lab with um, those crimes that the, the digital forensic case crimes typically range from could be homicides, could be child exploitation, could be extortion, um, kind of everything all in between. Um, it was really interesting work and I really wish I could like go back and do that work now with what I know now um, I, I'm sure I'll get into that later. So anyways, after that, so I was, uh, I was a police officer slash detective for seven years. After that, I went to the feds, uh, HHS OIG, uh, it's the department of health and human services office of inspector general. Um, I was there for a year and basically what that was, was assisting in, um, healthcare fraud investigations. So, HHS runs Medicare, Medicaid, you know, I may have heard of it. Um, a lot of fraud goes on naturally. So that's typically the scope of uh, the cases that we worked at OIG. And then now I work at Kroll where um, I got hired as a senior associate. Now I'm a vice president where I do digital forensic instant response, digital forensics and incident response, uh, mostly ransomware cases and insider threat. So that's kind of my journey. Um, it's, you know, I didn't go to school to, um, to be to do what I'm doing now. Um, I had long thought about it. I loved computers, you know, growing up in the late nineties with dial up, you know, I remember that I was old enough for that. Um, I was always on a computer all throughout high school, all throughout college. You know, I looking back on it, I probably should have done something computer science, but you know, Hey, better late than never. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much kind of how I got here. Yeah, thanks very much for sharing that synopsis. There's a lot of interesting things to talk about there. Um, one thing, if, if you don't mind talking about it, I'm, I'm sort of curious, um, if there was, when you're in Fallujah, if there was a kind of average day for a 19 year old Marine, you know, deployed in combat, what was, what was the average day like? <laughs> well, 
It was, uh, so we, in Fallujah, Fallujah is about a five by five square kilometer or yeah, five kilometer by five kilometer city. There's about 400,000 people there at the time. And we lived right in the center of it in a government compound. Um, it was actually kind of like an abandoned compound. I think it used to be um, a hotel, I think, because we lived in, in some abandoned hotel building. I was about four stories and sandbags would cover up all the windows and all that. Um, you know, if you, if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to go outside, which means you had to wear your flak jacket and your, your uh, helmet. And you had to have a weapon and it had to be loaded and it had to be ready to ready to use, you know, uh, condition one for those who are, who know their weapons. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a unique, it was a unique experience. Uh, we typically did five day rotations. So we do like five days foot patrols, five days vehicle patrols, and then five days, what we call FOB security. FOB is a forward operating base, which means there are operations that move out of the, the wire. So the wire is like, you know, inside the wire is you're in, in our territory, outside the wire is technically enemy territory or, you know, not within our compound. So a, a FOB is where you do things outside of the wire, things, you know, you sleep in the FOB and then you go do patrols outside of the FOB. Hopefully that explains it. So like I said, five days foot patrol, five days vehicle patrols, five days FOB security. So FOB security, there's all these posts all around. You're looking through basically a really thick bulletproof glass for four hours at a time, you know, four hours on, eight hours off, four hours on, eight hours off for five days. Um, then when you do the, the foot patrol one, you're going to wherever your lieutenant and your sergeant's telling you to go, hey, we're going to go hit up this area, this area, this area of the map. So basically what you do is if you have a squad of, let's say, 13 Marines, split it in half six and seven you basically leapfrog so you do that route but you leapfrog like that um so one once half of the squad is moving into a house you get you go in the house say hi to the people go to the you know get security to provide overwatch for the other one and you just kind of rinse and repeat you know whatever the route is so we would do that vehicle patrols obviously you can cover a lot more um a lot more you know uh, part of the city and outside of the city um on in vehicles so it's really kind of the same thing um except it's more four um four humvees i was typically in the front one i was a turret gunner uh because i had a, a light machine gun that i carried they automatically made us turret gunners whenever we were doing the vehicle operations so i was being the front turret gunner and a little convoy of like, you know, three or four or five Humvees, you're the one waving to people to, you know, move them out and that sort of thing. It's just, it's a really, looking back on it, it's an extremely dangerous job. <laughs> you're, you're sniper bait because you're the only one sticking out of the, out of the Humvee. And, you know, we did have issues with sniper fire. Um, thankfully, I never, never was you know, subject to that. But unfortunately, I do know people who were. Um, but, you know, I'm just, yeah, it was just a very, um, it was a very unique experience. I'm very happy that I had it at the time I did because I was so young. I don't think I had enough independent thought. And I think if it, if I were even a few years older with a little bit more life experience, I would have thought, hey, this is, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Or, oh, this is really dangerous. This is really stupid. Um, but I was so young and I was so fresh out of boot camp. I was all about just doing what I was told. And, you know, hey, maybe that saved my life. Maybe that saved other people's lives that I was around because, I did have that mentality and they did as well. Discipline, you know, doing the right thing when no one else is looking. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. It's, it's really interesting. The observation you made about being young as well. Um, uh, I remember once I was in a, I was at a conference um, uh, for the company I worked for in Las Vegas and I think 2006 or 2007. And there was a Marines ball, um, I think. Going oh yeah. And, yep. um, uh, fun. and I remember thinking, boy, these guys are young. Like they were yes. all 18, you know, and, yep. and I think, and, and then I remembered what I thought of myself when I was 18 and I mm -hmm. didn't think I was young, you know, yeah. and it, it's, yep. it, I thought I was a man, you know, and it's, yep. it's it was, you're very much not, <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and, and then, and then of course, you know, the thinking then they're there and like, it, I mean, this was 2005 or 2006, right? Yep. Like they're going, they're going to war. Yep. Um, That's when know. I was there. Oh, six, oh, seven. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was, I mean, it's like, I don't have much more to say about it, except like how like kind of serious it, it all was and sort of real. It totally sort of came to me just seeing and it, and it was kind of cute, too. Like, and I don't say that in a patronizing way, because all the young men yeah. had their girlfriends. But it was all like, you know, it was a date for the ball, right? You know, yes, and, and it's it was, a big thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it was and sort of so they were sort of enacting a kind of formality. But um, yep. you met there's there's you mentioned they're not really sort of like sort of, you know, you're, you're following orders. Right. And I've, I've got a couple of questions about that one is um, uh, 
when you said you were a turret gunner, so did you did you have any choice like in your in your in your pre deployment training? Were you given any kind of options for like what you might specialize in? <laughs> no, I was the new guy. I was relatively new to the unit. I had less than a year in service, and by the time we deployed, um, so like I said, I went to boot camp in June of '05, and then June first of '06, we got activated so technically i was 18 years old when i got activated for deployment i was a young guy and of course so in a, in a fire team a fire team is four marines so there's typically a saw gunner which saw is a light machine gun um and i don't know if you ever play call of duty or anything like that but typically there's saw on those on those games um and then like everyone else has an m16 typically so m16 is just your typical your rifle you know just in layman's terms so an m16 is about eight pounds a saw is about 24 pounds so new guy gets to carry the heaviest weapon because no one else wants to carry it because they've, they've all done their time or they, they can right. pull seniority. So to answer your question, no, I did not really have a choice as to what I did. And so once you are a saw gunner, I mean, you're the one in the fire team that's going to be in the turret, you know, because no one else. That, I'm, I'm trained for that. I'm, I'm trained for employing the light machine gun. Everyone else can, but it's mine, you know, um, so – that's kind of how that worked. Yeah. All and, told. <laughs> and it's interesting. You were also told what your name was going to be. I gather I, I heard about this story from a podcast I listened to preparing for this interview, but if you could just share that story again, um, uh, it's so interesting how you got your, your Twitter handle basically. Oh, sure. Yep. Yep. Buns of wrath 12. Um, so the 12, I'll just start with that. That comes from just when I started playing roller hockey, I'm a huge hockey fan and I'd start playing when I was 12. So there's that the buns of wrath. Obviously my last name is wrath bun. So that's pretty easy to see, but buns is actually what I was called when I was a cop. And that came from when I was overseas. So my team leader at the time while we were overseas, so you got to think about, think about the most stressful situation you've ever been in. Maybe when like, you know, calling 911 is involved or something like that. It's all your fine motor stuff just kind of goes out the window and it's all gross motor. You know, it's, you're just falling back on habits. You're just falling back on whatever's easiest, whether it's right or wrong. Wrath bun is not an easy name to say, especially when rounds are flying past you. So basically my team leader said, I'm not going to call you wrath bun. I'm going to call you buns. I'm like, I, I corporal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, what, what else can I say? No, mm -hmm. you know, the, that's, mm -hmm. that's, uh, yeah. That, so that's pretty much, that, that's pretty much where that came from. And it's stuck because it's, it's easy to say. It's fun to say. Hey buns, you know, um, it is, it's a great, it's a great nickname. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and so, yeah, so, so you, so you, you sort of finished, finished your service and you uh, went to university um, uh, and uh, with the intention of becoming, of becoming a cop, which you, which you did. And I know that an interesting part of your story, again, I guess, partly on the theme of, you know, you choose to get into it, but then where you go after that isn't necessarily entirely up to you. You were, you were kind of the sort of tech nerd guy uh, sure. in, on, on your shifts basically. And yep. then you kind of got told you're going into digital forensics. That's, that's correct. Yeah. I, I could type faster than probably anyone at the police department. Um, you know, I, I was the one always fixing, fixing the tech issues. Um, I work 6 PM to 6 AM during night shift. My first, my first four years, four of the seven years I was on patrol. I worked night shift, 6 PM, 6 AM. And you know, the IT staff's not there. Uh, so when people have issues, they default to the next best option. And I was that. So that word just kind of got around and, um, you know, I was told about a year ahead of time that, um, you know, hey, we're looking to, to expand digital forensics and we want you to do it. You're like, it's the no brainer. So I, I did that. I started my training in 2015 and then I believe it was January of 2016 is when I started uh, as a detective and, you know, working those types of cases. Yeah, I'm really interested actually in asking you about, um, you know, and of course we're going to like sort of define digital forensics and talk about what it, what it is because it's so, it's so interesting. But along the way, I gather from your LinkedIn profile that you wrote a master's as well. Um, I, yeah, I did. And that kind of, kind of to my point, how I didn't go to school for what I'm doing now, my master's is in human resources administration. So we got criminal justice, sociology, and human resources administration. Yeah, I work in cybersecurity. So that just goes to show you about something I'm sure we'll talk about before the podcast is over, that it doesn't matter what your background is, you can get into cybersecurity and digital forensics. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm 100% I'm on board with that. I'm a, I'm a former <laughs> English major who became an investment banker, you know. So, sure. Yep. <laughs> you know, there, there's, these, there's these things, these sort of skills cross Yep. Uh, cross areas if you're if you're willing to let them actually um and that that's a kind of important feature of that as well you know of course there's a lot of people who are like oh I, I i you know i learned this in school but i never use it in my job and whenever i hear people say that i'm like well 
I kind of feel like saying a little bit shame on you, you know, like, yeah, I, yep. I, bet, I bet you there's ways you could apply it. If that's, if that's so important to you that you could probably Ab- do it. Absolutely. Um, and your, your masters, I mean, you say it was in human resources, but when a very, it was in a law enforcement related thing, I, I see emotional intelligence in law enforcement. Um, yep. and so I, if you could just take a couple minutes to maybe talk about that and, and what you were writing about there. Sure. Yeah. Well, I haven't looked at that in a while, so I'll do my best. But uh, basically, there's a book that I really liked when I was a cop called Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement by Dr. Kevin Gilmartin. It's a fantastic book. If you know anyone who works as like a nur- anyone working shift work, so nurses, anything super stressful like that, vet techs, uh, vet- veterinarians, doctors, any- emergency room doctors, it applies to them. Uh, my wife is actually a veterinary technician, and she read it, and it's it's totally – it's totally applicable to her and her line of work, but strongly recommend it for any of the cops, you know, and any of those other, um, you know, the workers, you know, those types of jobs. But I really liked um, the concept of emotional intelligence and what it, what it meant, um, you know, taking care of yourself, your mental wellness, um, handling, being in control of how you react to things, because over time that'll compound if you react to things poorly, you know, and you, you develop that negative attitude. And the, that book actually talks about what's called the magic chair. So it's like the 12 hours that you work, you're, you're very, you're hyperactive, you're hyper vigilant, but then when you get home, you're just like a zombie to the world and you, you just sit in your chair, you watch TV and you're like, yeah, whatever, honey. Yeah, uh, you know, you're just, you're a zombie. It's, it's that magic chair. And it's all about trying to avoid falling into that, that routine of like, you are your best version of you at work, but then at home, you know, you're just, you're a zombie and you're just kind of letting life pass you by. And then, you know, that refers to suicide rates, it refers to uh, divorces, the high rate of divorce, you know, within those, those uh, lines of work, you know, emergency medicine, uh, law enforcement, you know, we all know, we've all heard it, uh, even the military, you know, people in the military should read this as well. Really great book. So I wanted to just talk, or I wanted to get try and figure out the prevalence of emotional intelligence within the law enforcement community. Cause like I knew the answer, like it's not really present for the most part, but I mean, without data, you can't really say that. Right. So, you know, I worked at a big 10 university, Michigan state university. And so the, the, the data set was from all the other big 10 universities. So I, you know, put out a survey, had all the questions and the, the group that I surveyed was just officers at the big 10 universities. And so it was, it was really cool. You know, I should, I should go back and read that. It's, it's been a few years, but uh, you know, I, I felt really good about it because I know that outside of that book and maybe a couple other ones, like I love a cop and uh, there are, I think there's spiritual survival for law enforcement. I think really outside of those three, there's not really a lot out there in terms of better understanding emotional intelligence within law enforcement. So I kind of felt like I was, you know, it was a gap and it needed to be filled. And, you know, quite frankly, someone could keep going beyond that. Did you get any, um, I guess, kind of, you know, probably the terms wouldn't have been used, but kind of emotional intelligence training uh, as part of your Marine training? Oh, no. <laughs> no. The emotional intelligence training in the Marine Corps is more so just kind of get over it, you know, move past it. It's all about mission accomplishment, that sort of thing. So, I mean, maybe it's different now, but, you know, back then while we were at the height of the Iraq war in the infantry, I mean, that's that's just not what it was about. Yeah, that's that. I mean, that corresponds to what I've heard from 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 people I know that it's it's kind of like break you down and build you back up and, and make you into that's exactly into a machine, yep. you know, um, and well, well, that's well great. On. Yes. That's great for that environment. That's what you need in Fallujah, in Ramadi, in Baghdad, in the mountains of Afghanistan. That's what you need. People got to learn to be able to turn that off. You know, once you reintegrate back in society, I think that's where like some of the struggle happens because if you are so good at doing that over there and then you try and apply those same principles back in society, I mean, it, it just, it doesn't work like that, you know? Um, and that's probably where some of the issues come from with maybe with suicides and, you know, alcohol abuse is just, that's how they cope. Like I was really successful here. Why am I not here? You know? And I mean, that's a whole rabbit hole that I'm, I'm not really that qualified to talk about, but that's just how I see it uh, based on what I know in my experiences. It's, it's really interesting. Actually. One thing, one thing I was thinking about um, preparing for this interview was noticing like, you know, from the bios, from some of the authors, from the, the uh, hitchhikers book um, and um, just sort of, you know, sort of looking around, I, I realized that a lot of people in digital forensics uh, and particular incidents response are, are sort of like um, often both former law enforcement and military. Um, but one of the interesting things, one of the sort of like through lines, I think is um, 
when you go on your shift, anything can happen because you're dealing with, you're often dealing with, you know, bad actors who, who need to, who, who can be as, as bad as they want to be about, about anything. And they can be in any, particularly I imagine when you were on patrol, for example, like they could be people in any state of mind, you know, at any kind of point yep. in their life, you encounter them maybe at their, every night you encounter five people on their worst night of their life or something like that. Correct. Um, That's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, sort of trying to keep that kind of in mind that like, that's not what normal people are normally like yes. must be one of the big challenges of doing that kind of work. Absolutely. The cynicism, you can't escape it. Everyone who's ever worked in law enforcement and probably even the military too, I would say is going to have that level and nurses too, right? I mean, they, everything that goes through a hospital door, I mean, they see it all, they have to deal with it and it's their problem. You know, often I would, I should say often, but it's not uncommon for sometimes when law enforcement can no longer handle an issue, an issue with a subject, like they have to go to the hospital and like, there's nowhere that the hospital can dump them off to, like they got to deal with it. So yeah, I mean, you can only expect some cynicism is going to come out of it. Everyone's got it a little bit, you know, I haven't been a cop for three and a half years now, but I still, I still have that, some of that cynicism, you know, as you get further away from it, naturally, it's just like, you know, when I got out of the military, I wasn't as vigilant, um, you know, loud noises still make me jump, of course, cause that's not fun, but I don't know if that'll ever go away, but you know, the further you get away from an event, especially something that shaped you so much like boot camp or like the police academy or whatever, naturally it's gonna, some of it's going to stick, but not everything will, you know? Yeah. It's uh you're, you're reminding me of, um, you know, sort of friends and relatives I have, you know, I've got a, a cousin who's a fire firefighter and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's fun. It's funny. I don't know why this occurred to me, but like, you know, sometimes when I'm, I'm a friend of mine, who's a nurse, for example, and sometimes when I'm sort of, I'll sort of be complaining about something in my life and they'll give me that like professional look. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like this is not a big problem then. Um, yep. You're right. Right. It's, it's all, it's all relative though. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the show generation kill before. Yeah. You have. Okay. So there's, you remember the reporter, the Rolling Stone reporter. Yeah. So there's one particular scene where like, there's a firefight going on and uh, I think his name is Lieutenant Fick. The, the, he goes up to him and the reporter's like, Oh, you know, all worried, you know, because there's rounds going through, but the firefight's like a hundred meters over there. And he gives him this, it's an awesome speech. It's like a minute long video on YouTube. And the, the key phrase is it's all relative, you know? So like what may be a big deal to you is like not a big deal to someone who's a cop, who's, you know, an ER nurse, that sort of thing. So when you said that, it reminded me of that scene. And I always refer back to that. It's all relative, you know, something that's a crisis to you is like just a Tuesday for someone else, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, uh, for anyone lis uh, listening who isn't familiar with the Generation Kill was a mini series that came out. I don't, I don't know when. Like, I think in the um, mid aughts or something like that. It was, it was quite a while ago. It was, it was like I want to say it's like two thousand six ish, something like that. Um, it was made by the guy who made The Wire. So if you like The Wire and you haven't seen Generation Kill, you absolutely need to watch it. It's like I think it's like seven episodes, mini series. So it's just one season. It's fantastic. I would say it's arguably the most realistic portrayal of. Um, I, the Iraq war, I would say, actually, I think it was 2008. That's, that's coming to me now. I'm, I'll fact check myself after this, but I'm pretty actually, sure this, it was. This is a, that reminds me actually, this is a very specific thing, but, um, uh, you've mentioned when you were, when you were in Fallujah, you had these shifts, um, and be four hours <laughs> on and eight hours off. Um, what did you do in your time off? Sleep pretty much. <laughs> okay. That was kind of like your, cause often you wouldn't sleep a lot on the foot patrol cycle. So sometimes you'd be out outside the wire on foot for a total of 16 hours a day sometimes, but that's not all at once. That's like you do a three hour patrol here, five hour patrol, a few hours later, four hour patrol here. So there's that prep time in between, you know, quick eat something. I mean, it, the op tempo, the operation tempo, I should say op tempo was just, it was nuts. Um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. So. Uh, yeah, and did uh, just very specifically, I guess, because like it, it's interesting how these things changed quite rapidly. I, and I only know this from like you know, Modern War Institute podcasts and stuff like that. But like, mm -hmm. did you have internet access, like, and then like smartphones and stuff at that point? No mm -hmm. smartphones. We did have really slow internet access. I think so. We had about 120 Marines, I would say, I may be off by 10 or so, um, that lived in this abandoned fort four story hotel. And I remember we had a room on one of the sides of the first floor of the hotel. And I think there were like three or four computers at most. 
Um, so we did have it. It was slow. We had a thing called River City. River City was where if we tip casualties for 24 hours, all phones, all internet is shut off because it's all about the family finding out officially from the government rather than, oh man, you know, so-and-so got, got shot or whatever. Because I think earlier in the war, that was an issue where they were finding out from buddies rather than from the government. And that's obviously not good. So, yeah, we did have it, but we were in River City a lot because we, we took a lot of, a lot of casualties. Yeah, not that, not that we need to go down all the, the, this particular path, but I gather that part the, the communication coming the other way can be a problem as well. Um, and it's something that I think the people in the military are still kind of grappling with that, like, you know, it used to be maybe you got your Dear John letter in the mail and, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of write a letter back and, you know, see what would happen. But now you can be like real, real time sure. kind of experiencing yeah. personal problems with someone on the other side of the planet or like hearing bad yep. news from home, you know, and then all of a sudden you've, you, you know, I mean, if you're, a, if you're on the, on the team or you're a commander and it's all of a sudden that, that soldier just got bad news. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. Now you've got to deal yep. with that too. Part of their mind is back home and that's dangerous. That's yeah. really dangerous. Um, yeah, but it was, it, it wasn't so much that when I was there because back in 06, I think that was shortly after like Facebook changed to Facebook and not the Facebook. Like, so yeah. it was very early in the social media world, you know, and it was, I think that's back when it was like actually wholesome. There wasn't like, you know, ads and all this stuff that it is nowadays. I you know I don't use it as much, nearly as much anymore. Yeah. You're, but, uh, you're uh, in good company uh, on that note. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, but so, any, so anyway, so that's all um, super interesting. And, and, and then, and so, and then you found yourself in this digital forensics world. So yep. um, uh, can you talk a little bit about what digital forensics is? And then we'll talk about incident response a little bit, a little bit after. Incident response is more like a kind of like a car crash on a highway. So think of like a hundred car pile up. Um, you have all these cars, you have all these injuries. You have to basically come in after the fact, you know, just like the police officers do. How did this happen? What was the damage that was incurred? Um, now more an incident response. What did the bad guy take? Because that's a lot of things of what you're dealing with is you're dealing with breaches and intrusions. What did bad guy do when they come into the environment that they don't have access to? What did they steal? What did they what did they delete? What did they encrypt? You know, that sort of thing. That's, that's what you're dealing with an incident response. Um, whereas digital forensics is, it's not so much that network element of like, Hey, someone breached someone's network, you know, a bad guy, a threat actor breached a network. It's, it's just more, you know, what, what did the person of interest do and being able to prove it with what artifacts that are on disc. And a lot of times we use artifacts that aren't there for, they're not meant for us. It's meant to make the operating system run, but researchers over time have realized, hey, Windows records this particular thing when someone does this. So when they do that, that means they opened a file. Um, or, you know, hey, this is what happens when someone creates a new file. And if that ends up being, you know, something of interest in your case, we know how which artifact to look at and how to parse it and make sense of it and be able to say, yep, this person made this file at this time. Or let's say, you know, an employee stealing documents from a company right before they leave or get fired, you know, um, we know how to, you know, browsing history. Uh, there's, uh, there's just so many different artifacts and new ones are being discovered all the time to prove that someone did something. So at a certain point in time. Yeah. And so just to um, uh, maybe sort of like make it a little bit more specific and pick, pick some specific examples, for example, so I'm, I'm just, and I'm genuinely curious because I don't know, but um, I once was sure. on a jury um, and it was for a uh, very kind of a, a relatively unique coordinated crime. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, one thing we got was, uh, as the jury, we got these binders full of mobile phone records. Um, oh, yeah. They weren't recordings, but they were uh, showing one number called another number. At a it's probably cell time. tower dumps, I would imagine. Okay, so but it's is that the kind of thing that you that you would that you would have worked on in your law enforcement days, like you know, yeah. get get the data from the from the whatever devices you were allowed to get and whatever data you were allowed to get off them, and sort of put it together to tell a story. Yeah. Yes and no. So if that was like a cell tower dump, that's obviously not something that's from like a phone. Like you hand me a phone here, I want you to look at this phone and see okay. what happened. Like okay. you're not getting that data from the phone. However, there could be like call records and obviously text and that sort of thing to indicate that. 
okay, this phone that had this number at this time called this contact, this contact, this contact. So there would be that. But then often what they'll do in crimes where involving cell phones is, and depending on the severity of the crime, of course, is get a cell tower dump. So take all the cell towers that are that are near, you know, wherever the incident was, and then try and find, you know, what activity was going to and from that device. So that's that's something that's very, very common in law enforcement. And that's something I didn't do a ton of. So I'm not going to pretend like I'm an expert at that, but I know that's like two different ways where you could get activity of, you know, when did device A have outgoing or ingoing or incoming or outgoing calls, um, either from the device itself or from like a cell tower dump. Or you could even subpoena like Verizon, Rogers, whatever, whatever, um, you know, cell phone company, if they do actually have that retained, because I think their retention rates, depending on the company, can be kind of short, like a week at most. So if the crime happened two weeks ago and say they only retain it for a week, you know, you're not going to have that data there for you. So, And would, would cracking passwords be something that you would, you would be trying to do as well? That's not something I, I do, but that is definitely falls under like the umbrella of like digital forensics and incident response. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, the kind of crimes that we're talking about here, I, I imagine there's a, there's a wide range um, probably from, you know, I mean, I don't know what, what, what I would pick as a sort of low level kind of crime, but, but, but basically it's serious enough that some evidence has been material has been seized. Um, and then you're, you're looking at it and you're, you, you've actually like got the computer with you, right. Or if, it, if it's a computer or something yep. like that, or a hard drive or something like that, but it's, you know, it's kind of like, I think I don't, I forget the acronym, but like CSAM or something like that. CSAM, yep. Child sexually abusive material. Yep. So some very that, serious stuff. And this is where yes. kind of like knowing, proving that someone opened a file, for example, can be very material to a case that you're Yes. Making. Yep. And I'll, I'll say quick something about CSAM as, as I call it. Um, I think the, those in the UK call it, I think it's CEM, uh, child exploitative material, I think. So there's different things. The main thing is that we're trying to phase out in the law enforcement community is child pornography because pornography indicates that is you're watching it for pleasure. You know, it's, it's not something people should be watching for pleasure. So the, the more appropriate term is child sexually abusive material or the CEM. It's just trying to get away from that whole child pornography just because of the stigma of that term, because those kids are not consenting to this and it's illegal and it's wrong. And so many moral ethical legal levels, you know, so it's not child pornography, it's child, child sexually abusive material. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, but yeah, some of the, some of the cases that I've worked um, with digital forensics, I was thinking this when you're asking, uh, asking your question, like nowadays, anything involves a phone, you know, that's like everyone's second brain. Um, one of the ones that just came to me was there was a drunk driver that was recording them driving like 90 miles an hour down a road. And I think it might've been a suicide attempt, but it's basically a T road. So you can only go left or right. You know, there's a cornfield if you keep going straight. And what they did is they went straight going at 90 miles an hour and they recorded it. So like that was the quote unquote, you know, the crime that um, I think it was like, you know, operating while intoxicated, causing injury or something like that. I don't know. Um, I can't remember, but you know, the video was on the phone. So like I had to go find the video, you know, and then put it in the report, narrate the video, that sort of thing. So, I mean, I don't think anyone ever would have thought of that. Like until that case comes across your desk, you're like, who does this? <laughs> you know, Like you never would have thought that a drunk driving case, whatever, like a phone would be relevant to it, but there, you know, there it was in front of me. Speaking of, and that's just, that, that's just one of many. So yeah. Speaking of things that people wouldn't think about, um, I was wondering if you could share a story. Um, I, I know you spoke about this on another podcast where you talked about a digital faux pas or something, a forensics faux pas, but um, you had this oh. great story, but you were actually on site sort of like physically searching for oh, yeah. material. And if you wouldn't mind sharing that story, it's uh yeah, yeah. Yep. I remember that. So yeah, that was, that was the largest case I'll ever work. I've ever worked in my career. And if you, if you do, if you do the math, figure out where I worked and what went on at that time, you'll you'll know exactly what case I was working. So um, that case, so we were doing a search warrant at the suspect's house, and we were there for like eight or so hours just searching for stuff. And I'll keep it high level. Um, but at the end of the day, we were about to leave with whatever evidence we had found, and one of the officers was that was 
like security for the outside of the house was like, Hey, they want to look at the trash. And, uh, we're like, no. And sure enough, because I think because there were so many cars outside the house that I, I think the trash had come, but the trash truck probably could not have gotten the dumpster. Um, well, there was evidence in the dumpster. Uh, there was a lot of evidence actually. And so sure enough, you know, we looked everywhere except for that. And it's obvious it's, it's the trash is at the end of the driveway on a day when the police show up. So it's, yeah, it's, I think the important lesson there is like, even though that person was not overly involved in the case at the time and is not the most technically savvy as in they were not a digital forensics detective, they were still able to provide that perspective and that idea because they're not in the weeds with us. And sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're so deep, you can't see the forest for the trees and you need someone like that um, to just like, Hey, did you do this? Insert simple thing here. No, no, I didn't, but I did all this other advanced stuff on the inside. Well, okay, let's take a step back. Let's do the simple thing. And that's where a lot of, a lot of bad stuff was. So yeah, it's it's one thing. One thing I really like about that that uh, that story is the arbitrariness of it. That is, I imagine, yeah. a feature of kind of basically crime fighting, right? Like, and you could probably have like, uh, what what if you know that person hadn't made that remark, and like six months later, you're I don't know playing golf or something. You're like, oh, yeah, fucking trash. Yep, yep. I didn't look. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I mean, I imagine that, that, and like, particularly in an area where like technology is changing so much, but also you're learning so much across time Mm -hmm. there must, it is, is regret a kind of feature of, of that kind of work or, or. Yeah, I, I would, I don't know if regret's the right word, but the way I'll articulate it is I remember work in that case and I was, I was relatively new at the time. I had maybe six or seven months on. And we worked that case, you know, for at least a few months. And I didn't know what I didn't know at the time. And I thought I knew it all, that sort of thing. And, you know, looking back on it and not even just that case, but so many cases, especially involving like, you know, Windows computers, which is kind of like what I, I specialize in now. You know, I think I've made, I made strong cases or I made the best I could with what I had, the evidence I had and the knowledge I had at the time. But like, I wish I could go back and have that mission of like, you know, saving, saving kids from, you know, child sexually abusive material cases, homicides. I would love to work another homicide, you know, something involving like a phone or a computer. I would love to do that. And I, you ask anyone who has prior law enforcement experience and now they're in the private sector, they would love to go back, love to go back and do that. Um, thankfully, I don't think, think, you know, thankfully I don't think anything that I, I didn't know or I didn't do like ever, you know, hurt a case or anything like that. But like just going back, I could, you know, I drew a little scribble picture back then for my cases. I could draw a Picasso with what I know now to put it as a metaphor, you know, like, yeah. So, but, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the work I did in the, the three, three or so years. It was really good experience. And, you know, without it, I wouldn't be where I am today because that was where I learned and, you know, and why did you decide to uh, leave law enforcement behind and go into the private sector? I had an opportunity. Oh, well, so I had an opportunity to go to the federal government, which is one I just couldn't pass up. And then after that, there's a lot of red tape in the government, both at the local level and the federal level, both great for getting experience. But like once you want, once you want to start doing like even this, this podcast here, this, I think like four lawyers and Washington DC would have to sign off on me being able to do this with you. And it would take weeks. Um, just running the discord server that I have, I had to, I had to wait a few weeks uh, just for them to like approve the thing I was already doing. And it had to go across four different desks of these, these lawyers in Washington DC. And I'm just like, I want to do a lot more than what I was doing at the time. And I'm like, I don't know if I can, <laughs> I can do it here. You know, it's just going to be too much of a headache. I'm sure they eventually would have, you know, approved whatever I wanted to do, but there's just a lot more red tape. And I, I think, I think I'm where I need to be for sure. And uh, what kind of work do you do now for uh, Kroll? Um, I do inst- digital forensics and incident response. So it's going to be a lot of, you know, responding to uh, companies getting breached. That's kind of the layman's terms. Um, so typically ransomware engagements is a lot of what we see. Um, nowadays we're kind of seeing more of the pre ransomware engagements where, um, 
and threat actor tactics are changing it seems like every month um you know now they're not really deploying ransomware as much whereas they used to six months ago um so it's really just anytime companies have hey i think someone was here who's not supposed to be here help us figure out what they did you know how many let's say they have a thousand computers in the network how many did they access um what did they do on the ones that they did access did they steal anything did they access our file server all of our trade secrets are sitting on this computer did they you know zip them up and exfil them to mega upload or mega.co.nz whatever it's called now you know that's kind of uh that's kind of the gist of that at a high level uh there's there's obviously a lot of really interesting things to talk about there i mean people would have everybody would have heard about you know some of you know solar winds and 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 things like that in the news um uh i guess i guess generally speaking i just have to ask you a sort of very general question like are 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 companies kind of were were companies jolted by by some of these relatively recent events into sort of upping their security practices and things like that i think that the way human nature works is you don't re- nothing's really a problem until it is so i think once an incident happens then that's when all of a sudden there's budget for the it department for the you know cybersecurity um internal cybersecurity so i think that's typically how it works um and also i i don't know why i really relate to like using metaphors and stuff but the way i see it is like so you, you mentioned you know like the solar winds all that stuff there's so many different ways to get inside an organization like if I don't know if you know what a CVE is, it's uh, like a no. it's like a critical vulnerability exploit. I think that's what it stands for. But basically, there's like 50 of those that come out every day. So the way I think about it, and the way I relate to it, to like you know trying to explain to my mom, for instance, who is not technically savvy, is think about building a house. Okay, you build a brand new house, right? You you get the keys today, you go right in. I can almost guarantee you an ant can get into your house. Even though it's a brand new house, completely brand new, should theoretically have very sealed windows, shouldn't be any holes or anything like that, I can almost guarantee you an ant can get in. That's kind of a way that I look at it with in cybersecurity is like there's just there's just so many different ways to get in. It's it's kind of like all cops and robbers. Uh, the robbers only got to be right once. The cops got to be right all the time, you know, and that's just an impossible standard to live up to. Um, it's only a matter, it's a matter of when, not if, as to when a breach is going to happen. And it's just a matter of how prepared you are, um, how much, how insulated you are from the impact of that. Do you have backups? You know, if, if someone were to encrypt all your files on your network right now, would that just be an, a minor annoyance or would it be end of the world for your business, you know, or somewhere in between? So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of how I, how, how I see that. There's, there's no way you can have an impenetrable fortress, you know? brand new house is still going to have probably a couple holes that, you know, I, I learned that bats can go through a, a pencil eraser. That's all the bigger hole they need to get inside your, your attic. That's nuts. You know, it's, it's, it's impossible, impossible to um, completely insulate yourself from, you know, attackers. Yeah. It's interesting. You actually, I, I would actually like to talk about that specifically about metaphors, right? Because I think I, I gather from some of the research I did for this interview that like, um, and this is actually, this is actually true in various areas of, of kind of IT when you're trying to talk to people who kind of might be in, in sort of senior decision-making positions who aren't tech savvy, um, yep. actually being able to explain things often involves metaphor and sort of developing a shared language and things like that is really yep. important. Um, uh, one, one example I think I, I heard um, from some DFIR guys was um, trying to explain a particular exploit was like, when people are like, why is it so widespread? And it's like, well, imagine there's a lock company and they made this lock and the lock is really popular. And it turns out one of the screws is defective and someone yes. figured that out. Now all the locks can, you know, and all like, the locks, yeah, all the locks, you know, it's like, how can it be all the locks? And it's like, well, cause yep. they were all built the same way. Correct. Um, and yep. uh, it's interesting too. I can say like from my personal experience, so I'm, I'm the sort of, you know, non-tech person at lean pub. And so anything that doesn't mm-hmm. directly involve programming first, sort of falls to me. So I kind of became the kind of de facto kind of security guy at LeanPub. And so I had to like learn, and I found it quite fascinating, but like how to look for like these patterns of people kind of like snooping around, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And like, well, I'm sure you know way better than, yeah. you, than what, I, what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I, but I, what I, one thing I sort of found interesting about it was like, oh, I'm totally doing this with no training. 
Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I'm sort of fighting off these guys. And by the way, this is not a big problem for LeanPub. We sell eBooks, <laughs> we, you know, we use third party sort of, we, we use Stripe and PayPal. They're pretty sophisticated sure. and stuff like yep. that. So like it's, but, but, but nonetheless, you know, there are, you know, the, there's the odd plagiarist, for example, who tries to, sure. and what they'll, what, one of the sort of super interesting things about it is the back and forth, because people will try something and you'll catch them and then they'll immediately try something else. Yeah, and then you'll catch sure. them and they'll immediately try something else. And yep. I've, I've even had interactions with people where we catch them and they get irate, you know, sure. they're, they're like, <laughs> they're mad. They got caught. <laughs> they're mad. They're, they're mad. They're mad at you for catching yep. them, even though they were trying to do something they know is wrong. And it just, there was this sure. just sort of very curious psychological yep. element to it all. Um, there is, <clears throat> you see that in law enforcement too. You see that very same thing, you know, catch people speeding and just, peeing in the bushes you know i worked on college campus so naturally that happened all the time you know <laughs> you know they're they're mad they got caught <laughs> yeah one 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 thing i noticed that uh, this is sorry i don't have to go on this too long but like it is it is interesting how like the infinite variety of it right so i used to live in montreal um and uh in a very sort of densely populated neighborhood with lots of like ground floor dwellings and i noticed what's there was someone going around putting bottle caps on windowsills um and it was to see if anyone was there because if oh. someone was there, they'd see the, the bottle cap. Yeah. Right. Up, and so you, right? they wouldn't break into that house. They wouldn't break it. If, if the, they came back and the bottle cap was gone, right. they'd know, they'd know someone was there, but if it wasn't gone. Very crafty. Very, very crafty. Gotta give them credit. So, so subtle, you know, like just yep. these, these techniques yep. and then, but then, so add on the sort of like complexity of, of, technology and like light speed communications and stuff like that. And it's just such a, such an interesting problem. And I, I wanted to take an example of, uh, of, uh, something called time stomping. Cause I know you, you made a video mm -hmm. about it so I can point people to it so they can watch the video. Sure. But if you could talk about just an, just an example of what time stomping is, uh, how you look for it and why people would, you know, do this kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, so time stomping is basically, so I'll, I'll explain the, so, in an incident response, we do what's called a timeline. So let's say, you know, on X day on Y computer, we think Z happened. Okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll timeline all of the events on the, on that system on, um, let's say windows computer by using different artifacts. Like I said, there's lots of locations on a windows computer that windows needs to record information to make the operating system function. But we leverage those as examiners, as artifacts to prove that certain things happen. So um, what we what we do is we do a temporal analysis. So you know, let's say the the bad guy, you know, RD, you know, RDP is remote desktop. Um, so remote desktop is like, so I have a laptop here, but I have a computer downstairs. I could remote into it, you know, okay. if both are on and that sort of thing. So yeah. you can do that like within a big, you know, corporate network, you know, you can remote from one computer to another, you know, so you don't have to physically be there. So Anyways, let's say bad guy re uh, remoted into a computer and then they were only connected for 10 minutes, right? Well, what happened during those 10 minutes? Well, what they did is they went to, you know, a website and downloads some tools that they're going to leverage for malicious for reasons, whatever they want to do. So let's say that they're going to download a tool that's going to steal your credentials because you have more um, privileges than, than, you know, the account that they're using right now. Cause what they want to do is they want to move around, get to the file server. And that's where all your files are. That's where, you know, all the lean pub books are right. You want to steal all those or whatever, or all your trade secrets or all your secret recipes, or they want to get there. So um, what they'll do is like, you know, they'll download tools and, those tools, they're they're gonna make a mark in the artifacts. They're, they're, there's going to be a trace of it. So what they can do is, rather than it showing up during that 10 minute session, what they can do is they can change the timestamp of that file to then make it look like it happened like, I don't know, three years earlier, right? So when I am looking at files that show up on that system during a given 10 minute time frame, it if I don't look hard enough. I'm going to miss it because they changed it instead of, you know, 10, 18, 20, 22, they changed it to, you know, nine, five, 2017. So it looks like that file showed up on disc in 2017 when it didn't, it showed up during that 10 minute session. So luckily there's different timestamps for each file. Um, and you, only one of them gets changed in most cases. Um, so you just have to know to look at the other one and like, Oh, it's going to show 10, 18 right here. Even though the one they altered right here is, 
nine five twenty seventeen or whatever I said. So it's just kind of hiding in plain sight. They know they can't completely remove traces of that. So they alter it enough to where anyone doing, doing just like the most basic analysis is theoretically could, could miss it. And some people do miss it, you know, um, but you just got to know to look for it and be wary of it. And typically if you find one timestamp file or folder or whatever, there's going to be more, you know? <laughs> so, and you, and you typically don't timestamp to the future. Cause I think that would stand out. Why is this file got a 2062 date? You know, the only time's not back to in the past, but you can in the future. Just why would you? That's too loud. Yeah. And I, I imagine the thrill is probably not the right word, but it must be kind of like, you know, when you when you because if someone's done this, they they've done it because they're trying to hide something and yeah. and they're trying to yes. hide something from someone they know is looking for it. Correct. Um, so like, Absolutely. Uh -huh. You don't do it accidentally. You don't trip yeah. on something. You accidentally hit the time stop button. That's not right. how that works. You know. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it may be taking the opportunity to move on to the next part of the interview where we talk about your sure. book. So in order to do this kind of work, you've got to have tools. Um, and uh, you've, 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 um, some of these tools will probably be very, very proprietary, um, but some <laughs> of these tools might also be open source. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your easy, easy tools. Easy tools? Yeah. Sure. Yep. So easy tools, the easy tools manual book. Um, it's a, an official manual for Eric Zimmerman's tools. Uh, Eric Zimmerman is a former special or former FBI special agent. Um, he now works with me at Kroll. Um, he has created, again, I'll talk in metaphors. So in digital forensics, we're basically doing a, an assessment of what happened on a system. So think of it as like going to the doctor and you're getting your checkup, right? You get your temp taken, you get your blood pressure taken. How do you get your temp taken with a thermometer? How do you get your blood pressure taken with whatever that thing's called? You know, how do you get your, you know, your eyes looked at? You have a different tool for that. So think of all the little different tools that a doctor uses against your body to, you know, get an assessment of what's going on in your body. It's the same thing. So, you know, examiners over years have, over the years have identified on a window system that, you know, this particular artifact can be used for this, this particular artifact can be used for that. And each one of those needs a separate tool to be able to parse that's what's called parsing those artifacts and then creating output that is human readable because a lot of this stuff is recorded in ones and zeros because that's how computers talk and read information. So these tools, again, the research is just mind blowing sometimes, but how to get that from computer readable or, you know, legible to computers to human readable. That's what these tools do. Um, it's really, it's really fascinating. And basically with all of Eric Zimmerman's tools, you could pretty much do a respectable uh, digital forensic examination pretty much for free, for free. And that's this, this manual was filling a gap in the community because so he, he's a former FBI special agent, right? So he's very big on the whole, not to speak for him, but I know this because we've talked about this a lot. We're big on fighting the, the CSAM fight. You know, um, the FBI deals with a lot of CSAM cases. I'm obviously former law enforcement. I dealt with a few myself. We are both no longer in law enforcement, but there's plenty of people out there um, that are still in law enforcement and have to deal with that. And they leverage these tools. So I know I'm getting kind of off on a tangent, but that's partially why I became so involved in some of Eric's tools because I know indirectly or directly, I guess, they are being leveraged by people who are doing the mission that I wish I could still do. Actually, rather if than that makes sense. That's, a, that's a perfect segue um, to my next, the next part of the interview, I think, where we talk <laughs> about your, your Hitchhiker's Guidebook, because we can't, sure. actually, I realize we can't really talk about that without talking about the Discord server that you set up sure. first and why there's, how it works and who it's for and the demand that it and need that it meets um so yep. maybe if you could talk a little bit about like how that how that started and 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 the community that's there sure yep uh so digital forensics discord server was started back in 2018 march of 2018 um i was a cop at the time i was a detective at um, michigan state university police department and that basically stemmed from and i actually cover this all not that one of the chapters i wrote in that hitchhiker's book um so i'll just paraphrase but what started out on Google groups was moved to IRC with like 10 of us, uh, IRC internet relay chat, basically really primitive chat. Um, for those who don't know, um, it pretty much started where I was trying to send a picture of like a phone that I was working on trying to, you know, get some data off of. And I needed to like, obviously provide a picture of, of it to the 10 other guys that I was talking to. Um, and IRC, that's really kind of, 
not, you can't really do that. It's just simple text. There's, it's very primitive. So I had to like upload to Imgur or however you want to say it, you know, and then provide the link. But like, I don't really want to take pictures of evidence and put it on that site. And then, you know, cause then it's like out there and that's just bad juju. So I'm like, Hey, we should go to discord. Cause it's something I just signed up for like six months ago. I know it's for games, but like, man, it's got like, it checks all the boxes for me. And I just, I really love using it. Um, and so we did, we moved to discord and what started out as pretty much like three of us, three, three became like 10, became hundred, became a thousand, became yesterday. I just checked. We're, um, technically over 11,000 now, which is unreal. So it's, that I, the way I break it down in the chapter to, to kind of show you the reach of it, you know, there's what 180 some countries or something in, in the world. What we decided to do at the beginning is we had roles. So if you're familiar with discord, you can assign people roles. So we created a role for, we wanted to separate law enforcement and private sector. If there's no, like if you have a law enforcement role, you see different things versus private sector. Like there's not that, um, but we just want it to be labels. So like, so, you know, a cop in Sweden, knows that they're talking to someone in the private sector, knows they're talking to a student, knows they're talking to whoever, you know, uh, someone who works for a magnet forensics or Cellbrite, you know, a vendor, a tool vendor. So that's what we did. So to, to bring it back to how the reach that the server has, I believe we're at 74 different countries. So like I would do law enforcement, USA, law enforcement, UK, law enforcement, Sweden, Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. We have 74 different countries. That's how far this has grown. Um, and then one of the stories that I mentioned in the, in the chapter that I wrote, the, the history of the digital forensics discord server is uh, there was a Alaskan uh, cop that reached out to me. and was like, man, thank you so much for making this. My nearest help. I'm, I'm a one man shop. My nearest help is like three hours away. And, you know, three hours in Alaska, that's especially depending on what time of year it is, that's got to be treacherous. So he's like, this has opened it up to people all over the world. Um, you know, I don't know everything. I don't have the budget to, you know, go to all this training. And I live in a very remote area, that sort of thing. So, like, this is my lifeline, you know, and. I can't tell you how many times on the server someone, you know, with a law enforcement role, for instance, says, hey, I'm working a homicide right now of a, of a 10 year old or something. I really need some help on this. And then it's just like everyone just is focusing in on that. You know, like we, we've had stuff like that before. We're working on a horrible CSAM case, working on a homicide, uh, working on something really awful that, you know, you just don't it's just unimaginable things. And but digital evidence is involved. And this community has helped those cases. And that's, there's nothing, there's nothing greater to me than that. The fact that this server has helped even one child, you know, helped with, help put someone who killed someone away, even one person, you know, something, something has been posted in the server that has helped someone at some point in time to put evil away. Yeah. It's uh it's uh thanks for sharing that story. I mean, it's so great. And it's, it's interesting how like, profoundly productive it is um uh you mentioned budgets and training for example you know some from what i gather some like you know could someone could have been in the experience you were in where it's like you're the dfir guy now you know mm -hmm. and they were like oh i've been on yeah. been a patrol cop and now you're what right you know and yeah. like and and so they're like what i, I don't even know what device this is you know, Correct. and and, yep. and now, like, all there could be people from all around the world in all different time zones, right? And like, because they might be working the night shift, so they might be up yep. during. The, they might be in day nighttime Singapore, daytime, you know, oh, Croatia, yeah. uh, and uh, and um, you know, be able to collaborate and help each other and basically recreate that a version of that story or like, did you look in the trash, you know, uh, yeah. but, but oh, kind yeah. of in real time, you know, they could be like, Oh, yes. you know, there's this Wait, Did you, did you look in this folder? Did you look in that folder? Did you know yep. that they found out about this exploit yesterday? You know, yep. all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And the beautiful thing about discord, one of the big reasons why we chose it over Slack was because it was, it was free. And like, let's say you join the server today, you have everything since March of 2018 to search you can search. So something may have answered your question that you have three years ago. And it's just sitting there. You just got to search for it. And so it's such a, a compendium of knowledge now, you know, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of chitter chatter here and there, but it's all, it's very professional. You know, everyone knows the purpose of the server, what it's there for. We have an off duty channel where you can let loose a little bit, but 
it's it's a self policing community. It's honestly it's a it's a beautiful thing. It really is. The community runs itself. Um, I couldn't be more proud of it, and I couldn't be more proud of the people who are a part of it that maintain the standards that that it. I mean that it's become. It's. I mean, there's a reason why it's won the Digital Forensic Incident Response uh, Resource of the Year three times in a row, and that's. It's not because of me. It's because of everyone else who shows up every day, maintains that professionalism, keeps everything on topic, um, just trying to help each other out. You know, that's what it's all about. And uh, whether it's moving forward, you know, a, a breach case, an intrusion case, or a CCM case, or a homicide, you know, it's 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 just really it's poetic yeah that's that's amazing um uh it reminded me of a much more trivial and far lower stakes version of that that we had at lean pub which was we were doing all our communications with authors who had problems one-on-one by email Mm -hmm. and one day we're like why why are we not making all of these communications like that can be made public public right because it's right created this author's forum on using discourse because it's like Post your question there. I mean, if you're willing to, like, by the way, for anyone sure. listening, like you can just email us at hello at leanpub.com if that's how you want to do it. But we've got this author's form. And so all of a sudden it's this searchable historical database yep. of people having problems looking for answers. And this is not something, you know, this is like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if, if you if you can do it without hiding, do whatever it is you're doing, you know, do it, do it without hiding. It'll help help everybody. Uh, Absolutely. Way, way more productive. And just, just on the last thing I'd like to ask you about that specifically on that note, do you vet people? Um, yeah, when, I mean, yes join? and no. So let, let's say, and and this is why all roles are equal. So let's say someone says they're a cop in Sweden, for instance, I'm not going to call their employer. I, I do so much stuff outside of my everyday job. I got a toddler, you know, like I, and you know, all the other moderators, they, they have lives too. That's why we just made it where if you say you're a cop, sure, you can be a cop. I mean, it doesn't mean anything really, you know, and quite frankly, if you start talking and you do have that, that, you know, law enforcement role, for instance, and you're, you're going to be found out pretty quick. I know cops. I know what they talk like. I know how people talk in the server. It's, I mean, it's going to stand out, you know, and you'll probably get exposed a little bit. So, um, I mean, there's really no incentive, you know, to vet people because, there's not like a law enforcement only channel, you know, and we, that's something that we debated back and forth and honestly still had that debate even like about a month ago. It's ultimately, it's just, cause let's say you're a cop today, but you put in your two weeks notice a week ago and you're not a cop tomorrow or next week, you know, am, am I going to know that? No. But then now for the rest of your life, you're going to have access to a law enforcement only thing. And then there's the thing where everything you post on discord is technically not owned by you. Discord owns it. So and it's also technically the public sphere. So don't ever post anything that you wouldn't want to hit the news. And that should be just, you know, anyone in law enforcement knows that they, it's always less is more, always better to say, you know, less than what you really want to say sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it's uh, it is, it is interesting. I, I would say like, no, I don't have the experience at this level or with this type of seriousness, but like a lot of these, these things are kind of self there are self-correcting mechanisms um, that, yes. that exist when you're when you're when you're dealing with true professionals. Most yes, um, that you know it's you you kind of have to be one to to not stand out uh, within those kinds of communities. Yep. Um, uh, and uh, just just moving on then. So now that we know what what the what the Discord server is, we can talk about your book, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to DFIR. Sure. So you sort of crowdsource this uh, the the articles in this book from the community. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it all started out like, you know, as, as my time at Kroll has gone on, I've, I've done more things in the community. I've done like, you know, talks at, at Sands and uh, I do stuff on GitHub. I help with Eric Zimmerman's tools, that sort of thing. And, you know, as you start doing some of that stuff, you kind of get, I don't want to say a check in a box, but like, okay, yep. I've been doing this for a little while. Like what's next. And so eventually I got down the list where I'm like, you know, I, I, I've done blog posts before, but never really, you know, publish a book or anything like that. Never really thought about it. Never ever thought I would be ever thinking about it until all of a sudden I did. And I'm like, huh, you know, so in an effort to kind of dip my toe in the water, I just kind of got an idea. And I, I don't, I don't really know where I got the idea from. I got the idea of lean pub from someone else that I followed because they wrote, I think a few books, three or four books on lean pub. I'm like, Oh, this is a cool platform, you know, reading about it and, you know, seeing the whole 80% royalty, the self-published thing, you own it. I'm like, ah, oh, I can, I can dig that. That's cool. 
Um, but I'm like, yeah, you know, I use GitHub a lot. Oh, cool. You can write on lean pub using GitHub. I'm like, Oh, let me, let me look into this a little bit. And so I kind of toyed around with it myself. I'm like, Oh yeah, I could, I could see this basically marked down, you know, more or less. And, um, I'm like, I bet you it would be really cool if we could just get, cause no one, no one wants to write a 300 page book or 400 page book, the average person, but in the community where blog posting is such a common thing. I think people could commit to a long blog post and that's kind of how I went about it. Like, Oh, there's my cat. Um, <laughs> um, I got five of them. So you might, oh, nice. you might see some more. So um, I, I basically said, Hey, if you can just commit to one chapter, you know, if I can get at least like 10 people want to commit to a chapter, let's, let's do that. You know, I'll write a chapter, I'll write the intro and I'll write a chapter of my own. And then you just pick a topic. It can be a hodgepodge. You know, this isn't meant to be a college textbook. This is more proof of concept. What this will do for, for me and for anyone else who wants to do it is it'll make you a published author. You can say there's an ISBN with your name on it. You know, so like, that's kind of like a, Ooh, you know, that's, that's all fancy and stuff. Um, little did I know how easy it was to like really procure an ISBN and to self publish using lean pub. That's, it's, it's really easy. It's really nice. Um, and that's why I ended up doing the second book, the easy tools one. But yeah, that's kind of where it came from is like, I just made a channel on discord. I'm like, Hey, I got this idea. Hey, let me know if you want to do it. And I got, you know, probably 15 or so hands raised. And, um, I basically said, okay, um, you guys can work on whatever chapter you want. Once I have about 10 that are finished, right. Cause let's say you book 15 people, you know, 10, hopefully we'll finish. We'll actually finish. Once we get 10, let's publish version 1.0. So we did, we got the 10 chapters or 11 intro plus 10 and published uh, version one on August 15th of this year. And since then we've released version 1.1, which was the 11th chapter. So I'm just waiting for a 12th chapter to be finished. Anyone who's listening to this and, you know, wants to contribute a chapter, just finish a chapter. We'll push out a new version. So basically thinking once we get to about 20 chapters or so that are published and finished, we'll probably put a wrap on it. Um, and then, you know, do the print ready PDF and, you know, Cause I would like to have a physical book. Right. Um, so I think we'll, we'll end up doing that eventually. Um, it's just a matter of getting the amount of chapters to be really feel complete. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how that started out and it's been a great experience. I'll speak for myself, but in talking with a couple of the other co-authors, they love doing it. Everyone's relatively familiar with GitHub just by being in this field. Um, and then to do it, writing a book is just really, I think that was just kind of unique and I think it worked out really well. And, you know, I, I plan on continuing to do it because I already do enough stuff on GitHub. So I might as well, might as well write a, write a book and I've, I've open sourced that book. So anyone can technically, if they find an error, they can just do a pull request on GitHub and, you know, add that comma or correct the way I spelled onomatopoeia or whatever, you know, <laughs> Thanks very much for sharing that story. That's so great. I mean, there's so many, there's sort of like five classic lean pub elements in there. Right. I mean, so when we yeah. started out, it was a blog to book kind of idea, right? It's like, there's all these people with all this content out there, put it in a book, um, uh, yeah. you know, and, um, and then, you know, sort of people from, you know, co collaborating in different communities and putting things together all separately, but using, using GitHub, which is like this for anyone listening who is, doesn't know about it. It's this, you know, incredibly sophisticated collaboration tool, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that allows people to kind of like have a kind of, you can think of it a kind of main, main manuscript file that mm -hmm. people can then get themselves, make a change to, and then submit a sort of a pull request or they can, they, yep. can, they can sort of send it up to the administrator as it were and say, Hey, will you accept this change or not? And this can yep. be as easy and you can, you can actually do it all in the browser now too. You don't need to learn about, terminal or command line or anything like that mm -hmm. you can actually follow the link in the back of either of of of, of these books um, that andrew's talking about to the github kind of issues page and you yep. can submit an issue even um uh you know oh, sure. and, uh, and say and it could be a typo and if you're listening like authors love hearing about typos uh and yep. fixing them um and uh particularly uh one of the things that that's been so popular with lean Bub in particular is that since so many of our authors are programmers they 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 found the sort of like conventional publishing process where it's like it's my book and i have to submit a change to someone else to change it and then i have to wait for some whole process to go through why can't right. i just go like 
delete, replace, you know, and then yes. save and publish and click the publish button. And so with something like GitHub, like someone anywhere in the world could find could find a typo in your book, submit it, you could get a little notification and be like, oh, and then you could fix your typo, typo and click the button and you've got yep. your book updated for everyone who can download it yes. you know, in, in the world right away. Uh, and and so it's, it's just really great for collaboration and, and stuff like that. I, I love it. It's, it's awesome. We control the publishing tempo. You know, um, I get asked from, I get kind of, I don't want to say outdated. I get these outdated questions from people who are just familiar with like traditional publishing. Like, so if I complete my chapter, when can we publish? I'm like, we can publish it the same day. All we got to do is review it and I can hit a button and boom, you know, we, we got it. So it's, it's kind of changing the, you know, trying to change like the paradigm a little bit with, um, how to, how to write a book, or at least in our community. Um, because there's not very many people who have written books in our community, but now all of a sudden we just added 12, you know, people who have written part of a book, you know, and I'm sure more will come. I know I plan on doing more. Um, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Um, I think with a lot of things, it's really just getting over that initial barrier of entry. And I think, you know, now that I know just the basics to it with, you know, getting the ISBN number and then the way that you can do it in LeanPub, doing something that I've already been doing the last two years on GitHub and been contributing to various digital forensic tool projects and scripts and that sort of thing. It's like, it's the same thing I'm doing. It's just, it's not a forensic tool. It's a, it's a book, you know, it's just, it's, it's really just resonates with, with me and, and the community, I think. Uh, the last question I always ask on the podcast, if the guest is a Lean Pub author, um, is if there was one thing that you absolutely hated about Lean Pub that had you shaking your fist and yelling at the screen over, or if there was one magical feature we could build for you, um, can you think of anything you would ask us to do? Oh, put me on the spot. Um, the one one thing I think would be really cool. Do you know what um, Markdown Monster is? No. Markdown Monster is a really cool tool. It, it does, it, it's specifically for writing in Markdown on the left and then your previews on the right. And I know there's tons of different text editors that do that. It would be cool to have like a Mark, however you say it, Markua, right? Is that how Markua, you say it? Yeah. 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 A Markua monster, something where, because like I, I know if sometimes like Slick, Slick Edit, I think is like a, um, a site where it's kind of the same thing, but it's on the web browser. You know, you're typing your Markdown on the left and then you're seeing the preview on the right. It would be nice to have that of that live translation, but in your particular spec, because I think that's where um, some of the issue was. So like what I did on our particular repo was, you know, I made our chapter one dot TXT two, three, four dot TXT, but because no one really knew Markua, even though it was like pretty similar, I made chapter one dot MD chapter two dot MD. So like they could actually see how their, their chapter would have looked very rarely though there were some cases where like what they did in markdown didn't totally translate it was very rare but it would be nice to have that like native markua on the left the live preview on the right that someone could leverage be it on lean pub or on some third party site or you know i'm not saying you guys got to write your own tool and make it just because i'm saying this like markdown monster but you know it's it's just dedicated to that live preview of your particular spec to the live to you know what's actually going to look like so yeah thanks very much for sharing that um we we have had that feedback from authors in the past um uh i mean basically the way it works for anyone listening is you know you sort of you're writing you when you write a lean book you write it in plain text which means you have to type in the formatting instructions which sounds a lot more complicated and difficult than it really is it's kind of like if i want something to you know in, in the old days when people typed on typewriters and submitted their manuscripts to publishers or whatever you had to do the same thing right because you couldn't you couldn't format things on a typewriter, right? So for example, the reason there was an underline feature on old typewriters was to indicate, I want this to be in italics. Um, and so Markua is basically the sort of book, modern day kind of writing on a computer book version of that, but you write in plain text. Um, and uh, and so what that means is that what you it's not what you see is what you get, right? So you have to type this manuscript and then what you do on LeanPub is you click a button to create a preview and you sort of cross your fingers and hope, hope it all comes out correctly. And over time you learn and it, and you know, it's, it's, it's not really much of an issue, but the first time you do something, and especially if you're working and collaborating and inviting new authors on, you know, the first time they do something, they're not quite sure what it's going to look like. Um, especially if you're doing something more complicated, like tables and figure captions yeah. and, and things like that. And so being able to have, if you're working in the browser mode or if you're on some kind of tool, for example, to be able to sort of, 
see that happening in real time instead of having to click a button and watch the sort of you know progress bar happen until you get your your PDF or your EPUB that you're looking for. Um, would would is it would be you know a big advantage. It's something people have asked for in the past. I'm I'm confident it's something we'll do someday. Um, but we, you know, we've got, you know, a lot of other stuff on our plate and for now, yeah. for now it's kind of click the button and wait, wait a minute and you, 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 you kind of yeah. see the result anyway, but, but it is definitely That's something fair. Asked, people have asked for, particularly because they know from Mark, Markdown that there are these tools. I hadn't heard of Markdown Monster, but there are tools out there where that happens. Yeah. So it's definitely something that that's, that's on our radar. Um, well, Andrew, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to to talk to to me and to our audience. And um, thanks for being game for we covered a lot of ground. Um, uh, and so thanks for being game for answering all these questions where I was putting you on the spot. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for using LeanPub for your great uh, project. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Had a great time. Thanks.